tell me, Doug Scott Kramer. Welcome to On the Edge with Andrew Gold. I, I want to hear about um, some of your story. Tell us who you are and, and a bit about your background. Sure. I assume that we're talking about um, the main feature of my life, which was growing up at a cult called Scientology. So, um, I mean, I do other things. I'm not just an ex-Scientologist, but that had a massive, massive impact. And it was the through line for my existence. If you want to hear the story real quick, I can give you a quick background on how my father got into it and sort of uh, the quick timeline so people know who the hell I am and and what what we're talking about. Is that okay? Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So around nine years of age, my father, um, who was a normal guy, we had a normal family, and he went down to work one day and he saw an ad um, at the bottom of a newspaper that said Dianetics. It said, learn how to communicate better or fix your family problems. These, um, these buttons, as they call it in Scientology, that, would, that people would respond to. And since my dad kind of has, is a bit of an introvert and has had difficulty communicating with us um, in general, he, that registered. So he went down to what was called the mission. Scientology had missions back in the day. And this is in Ventura, California, about 15 minutes away from where he worked. So long story short, and we can get into what happened to him that day. He came back to our house with what I describe. If a person in the military has been traumatized, maybe they have uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder and they come back with a thousand yard stare or the hundred yard stare, um, the blank look like nobody's home. So my dad came home with that look in his eye, started talking in a strange way and said to my mother, I need to borrow a fairly large sum of money from my brother, because we didn't have a lot of money at the time, to do this new thing that I just discovered called Scientology. My mom freaked out. I didn't know what was going on while they they were arguing for a few weeks. And long story short, it was either going to cause a divorce possibly if my dad wasn't allowed to do it, or my mom needs to go down and check it out so uh, he can do it. Long story short, she got sucked into it eventually. And then they would double team me whenever I'd have problems in school, I'd have problems with a girlfriend or whatever. They were trained how to manipulate me to break me down and get me to go down to Scientology. Now, I hated Scientology for the longest time. I didn't know what it was. We didn't have the internet, so you couldn't um, Google Xenu. I didn't know what it was. I just knew the evil entered our house. Something was different about my dad. My mom didn't like it. All of our instincts said um, something's bad here. But like I said, she didn't want to face possibly getting a divorce. My dad insisted on doing this. And um, so she went with it. Because of that decision, like I said, me and and, uh, my sister, not fully, but a decent amount. I was the black sheet of the family, so they worked on me the most. But once Scientology comes into someone's family, it's a serious thing. It's not a, a, a church on Sunday thing. It's a whole life change. So we all got sucked into that. And since I what they would do is they would put me down. I was, I was the black sheep, so I was doing typical teenage rebellion stuff. Nothing too bad, but um, I would get in trouble a lot. So they would sit me down. They would allow me to offload and open up and be honest with them. And then at the very end, and this happened many, many times, they would say, do you want to be punished for like a few weeks or a month? Or because we believe it'll help you out. Can you just, would you accept a course that we pay for, a $50 course to go down to Scientology that we believe will really help you out? So I told them to go F themselves most of the time. Eventually, I kind of went with it. And it was the gradual seeds of indoctrination that were going in. Scientology makes a lot of sense at the beginning. There's a lot of tricks and snags. I want to be up front. It's a con from the very beginning. You're being put into a hypnotic trance with their drills. And it's very, very dangerous. However, initially, before they hit you with the space opera and the stuff, because it's boiling a frog in the water, it's very slow, it makes a hell of a lot of sense, Andrew. So seed by seed, this was going in. I had a vulnerable point in my 20s, and I took to it. Again, I'm making a long story short. So from around 20 to 33, I was a 100% manchurian candidate believer and dude they make manchurian candidates i'm not using that as a word to uh for effect i was in a different reality i totally believed it and even though i've been out 12 years now andrew i woke up in january 2008 because a concerned friend from my acting class dropped off a cult book 
called Combating Cult Mind Control by Steve Hassan. And I was out of Scientology in about 20 to 30 minutes reading that book. But between even being out over 12 years now, people don't understand, man. I know it looks stupid. Scientology looks stupid to me when I was a kid, and it looks stupid to me now. But the uh, technology of how to brainwash someone is in all these cults. And Scientology happens to have the most comprehensive package of mind control techniques, I think, of most of the cults. So it's very weird even today realizing that that wasn't true. I know it wasn't true, but dude, I'm telling you, when you're in that Truman show and they hypnotize you, it's just as believable as real reality. All the stupid stuff that we believed in. You should clarify what, for those who haven't seen the movie, um, and I imagine it was a book, what the Manchurian Candidate was, and, and what you know what it what it what that feels like to be in it. So hard to describe, but well, it's based on um, you know there's there's the famous movie that people know about, um, and there's also a movie called Telephone T E L E F O N I believe, where they uh, you know in the um, 50s, 60s, and 70s, they, they had Project MK Ultra, where the intelligence agencies and the CIA, this is all documented. This is not conspiracy theory. I'm sure you would, you, you know that. But they were trying to basically um, use hypnosis, pain drug and hypnosis, was L. Ron Hubbard um, called it when we were in the cult, because he was trying to expose it while simultaneously taking that technology and doing the same thing to us. So in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, I don't want to get too deep into this, but you're asking about the Manchurian candidates. So that takes us back to Operation Paperclip and Project MK Ultra when they when the government, the intelligence agencies were trying to make people that they could implant with suggestions using hypnosis and drugs and get them to kill, to be a courier during times of war, to deliver messages and not have any memory. They have a whole bunch of sub projects that they created and tested on. Um, People in prisons, um, uh, high universities, Stanford University, all over America, Canada, and even in Europe to test out if they could um, control people in this way. Scientology is a takeoff of that, Andrew, and it's hard to describe, but I can tell you, having lived it, it, it absolutely can make you go against your own moral code. People are, you know, it drives me nuts when people say you can never be hypnotized to do something against your own moral code you absolutely can and uh i would have died for i would i would have done everything that L, i did do everything that l ron hubbard told me i lived my life by that and no one was going to come along and take that away from me or peel me away from that belief system i was it, it made me uh, believe so a long story short is a manchurian candidate even though they fictionalize it a bit in movies so that when you do come out and say, hey, I was a Manchurian candidate in Scientology, it's just like, oh, you just watched too many movies. No, that was a real thing. And they exaggerate it and put it in movies and perhaps desensitize people from how serious that is. And that's what that's what Scientology does, dude. They make you into just like any cult. You know, you could take the children of God. You could take the Jehovah's Witnesses. It just basically is brainwashing that makes you absolutely dedicated to the cult leader and then the parents and everybody around you can't talk sense into you because you're subconsciously programmed where it's out of your own awareness so you can't see the mental prison and the mind prison that was created does that answer it at all yeah no it does absolutely i think what's really interesting about your particular experiences and what maybe runs counterintuitive to runs counter to how we might uh, imagine being a cult if we haven't been is that when you were young I mean you were nine years old when your dad got into all this stuff you'd think that would be the point when you'd be really into it but actually you were pushing against it even as a nine-year-old and then maybe in your 20s that would be when you'd go oh none of this this can't be real but that was the moment where you really got into it like how how did it go that way around it is a trip Kate I look at myself as a case study because I don't know of any people that that's really happened to I'm sure it has but yeah um Okay, so here's what happened. Um, I was, I, I, I've always been a right brain person, meaning I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to do something outside of the system, popping out of the womb. So that is kind of the, the through line which got me into Scientology, brought me out to Hollywood to do acting and stuff. We could talk about that stuff later. Scientology had a ton of, of appeal to me, even though I hated it, because it takes you into an out, out there kind of, there's no limits. So 
you're an all like you live past lives. This life isn't all that there is. There's these really heady concepts that are very attractive. So even though I, and there's a discipline in Scientology, which I was lacking, which I liked. So there's, there's many things that I might still, even though they have nothing to do with Scientology, I still entertain these concepts, man. I've always believed that there's more to reality than just what we're presented with. I mean, we're just basically bombarded constantly from the education system to the propaganda that hits us on the news. It's very similar to what I went through in Scientology. So even though, like like I said, Andrew, I hated it because I it could feel just like my mother. Her motherly instincts told her that evil entered the family. My dad changed. He was, like I said, hypnotized of the dead eyes. It was obvious that it was evil. However, if you're in that environment, you know, um, I would, so I'd get punished every few weeks, every few months, and this would happen over, I didn't take, let's see, my dad got into it t at nine, I got to do it at 20. So there's about 11 years of every other month or whatever being in and around it. And like I said, the initial courses, they have a whole thing called ethics technology where you can map out your life and do things exactly right. Um, they, have th they have all sorts of tools and they love bomb you and you're in an environment where everybody's trying to help you. And then they show you this grade chart, this bridge to total freedom, which is every organization that says, you're not just a flesh being. There's all these different levels, which will actually, re re you'll remember who you are and you'll be totally free. And also L. Ron Hubbard had a whole system that was already something that I was into popping out of the womb. And that is consensus reality seems limited. And L. Ron Hubbard pushes the idea and pushes massive conspiracies that you're just more F, F the government, F the schooling system. You're more, you're, you know, don't listen to authority. So that was really attractive to me and a lot of people. So I'm not saying everybody, but they have a lot of dreamers, people that think that there's more to life than just working a freaking nine to five job. So that I think is what hooked me and other people. And yeah, my dad, I, that's interesting because my parents uh, are very system left brain, completely by the book people. With or without Scientology, that would have created and did create a conflict in my family. I was trying to kind of, I wanted to move, I knew what I wanted to do as a kid, I wanted to be an actor. And just to get out to Hollywood to even begin that, especially having Scientology on my back, with which both helped and encouraged me and simultaneously was preventing me, having all these elements going on, it made it just difficult with um, my mother and my father. Now my dad was in the Navy, and Scientology is set up in a very militant way that mimics the Navy. They have Sea Org members that sign billion year contracts that wear these very intimidating uniforms that look exactly like the Navy. I think that's what hooked my dad because they have very, you know, L. Ron Hubbard was in the Navy. He was probably an intelligence operative of some sort. And he used techniques that were very similar. I think my dad, even though he's a, a left brain thinker, I think he was attracted to the discipline part of Scientology. And he, Andrew, my family is so secretive. And there was just like nothing I knew about my parents growing up, really. And I didn't realize just how secretive they were until I got out of Scientology and started doing my own investigation about Scientology itself and my family's background. But the cult and the secret society stuff runs in my family. I got a 20, for my 21st birthday, I got a Freemasonic ring, which was a hand-me-down from my grandfather. And he was in the police department. My family history is deep in shady stuff. And my, um, I, I think, I hate to say this, man, but my parents didn't like sell me off to Scientology or I wasn't, you know, they weren't making any deal. They didn't get any money to put me in there. But my dad is so programmed and my my parents are so programmed that they kind of just sold me off, dude, um, to do to insist to put me in a program that's really dangerous. And to this day, they have no idea because they're still Scientologists. They have no idea the damage that it did to me. They don't, I don't know if they know that I speak out about it. They're completely. They're Manchurian candidates that can't recognize anything that's been going on around them, you know. We got recently, like, so I had some, 
Elgin Strait, who who was, I guess he was born, yeah, he was born in the Unification Church, the Moonies. Um, and they, even more than many other cults, have this feeling, a lot of the people who have left, a lot of the children of those couples, that they were sort of commodities, like they were used by their parents in a sense, because the only way that the parents can get into heaven is by having a child in the church. So it's like their tickets to heaven. And by leaving uh, this, when Elgin left, it's like his parents can't get to heaven anymore. So there's all this guilt and stuff. And I think it's quite a common thing in cults people did you feel in, in any sense a bit less like a, a son who's a, being being loved and cher cherished and more like a commodity in a sense 100 percent. and just to not throw my parents under the bus because they're good people they have a lot of good qualities like i said i feel for um, most of the people in scientology and these cults are victims they're not psychopaths they're not narcissists some of them are but for the most part they have no idea what happened to them so yeah i felt like um my parents are not trying to harm me. They were just doing what they believe in. Just like if you're born into an Orthodox Christian family, they know that the way to teach their kids is to go to heaven. And this is the way you do it. The book is everything. So it's not that people are mean or idiots. They're just simply passing on their belief system. So by my parents doing that though, they took my life. And I don't regret it now because I've gotten something out of this experience, but it almost killed me. I wanted to suicide myself and I went through a massive post-traumatic stress disorder event for about a decade once I woke up in January 2008. Like I said, my parents are oblivious to all of this. My dad's at the very top of the bridge and has been for about 20 years. They um, would consider themselves the most loving, decent parents. We gave our son everything. If they knew I was talking out about it, I'm sure they do. It's just weird that the church hasn't showed up at my door. I don't know what the hell's going on. I expected them to come to my door two days after I put out the first video. I've heard they don't do it as much. Oh, they definitely don't, Andrew. But I don't want to underplay it either. It's just that so many people have spoken out. So many brave souls that came before. We had Going Clear in 2015, Leah Remini's show, uh, Scientology Aftermath 2017. Dude, when I was like shaking, like still afraid to talk out about this these shows and everybody that spoke out before is made it what it is today where yeah you do, it's no problem but they still i don't want to underplay it either because they still do fair game people it's just too many people are speaking out so you're right about that and fair game uh, for, for those who don't know what that means as sort of a verb what, what is that Sorry, man. Sometimes I slip into these stupid Scientology words without explaining them. I think a lot of people will know that because a lot of people have seen all the documentaries and things, but I just always want to, you know, I'm always conscious of that for the few who don't. Good call. Yeah. I try to be conscious of that too. So fair game means, um, especially back in the 80s and 90s, and even when I came out in January 2008, Anonymous had just hit the scene where they started to expose Scientology worldwide. Like I came out the same month that Anonymous did their worldwide protest in January 2008. So I came out at the exact right time. But let's say before that, they because they didn't have the exposure that they have, they would hire private investigators to go through people's um, garbage cans. They would do, they do all sorts of things I don't know what I can say on here. I don't want to libel m myself or anything, but let me just say that, well, they had an intelligence operation, which is called OSA. That stands for Office of Special Affairs. That's the equivalent of their CIA. Their CIA called OSA was um, more effective than the actual CIA itself. So that gives you an idea of the ops, the operations they were able to run on critics. And dude, there's a whole litany of it on the internet like I said, people, many brave souls have actually died for this, um, have gone insane, have had their lives destroyed. They have caused so much damage for a group with only 30,000 give or take members. It's incredible the damage that they've done. It's, would it, and I, I, I don't mean for this to sound glib or facetious or whatever, uh, but w would it sort of almost be providing it didn't go too far almost a badge of honor if you did sort of see on the wet on the internet one day like a doug scott kramer page that they've made and some like a bunch of lies made up about you i don't i i don't really here's the thing andrew i'm not i'm not against scientologists or scientology i'm not attacking them personally l ron hubbard's the one that created this well even he didn't create it but let's just say he's the founder and like i said earlier most of them are victims so i personally since i lived it i understand what what they're, what, how it works. My whole channel is basically about breaking down how the trap is done. 
so that people like me don't just think that they're, they can't fall into a cult. Oh, I, Zenu, I'd never fall for that. How can these idiots fall for that? What they don't see is the mechanics of how the trick is done. This shit is used on us all the time, every day, 24 seven, dude. So for someone to come along and say that they, they're oblivious or, or not oblivious, but that they're, um, they can't be susceptible to mind control. That's a really stupid statement, in my opinion, because everybody is. And one of the things that I got out of Scientology, which I'm thankful for, despite the torture of it, is that it completely opened up my eyes after I came out of the cult to see just how much what L. Ron Hubbard is using is used on the global scale. And that allowed me to protect myself because it's not something new that these cults are doing. They've been around since ancient history, dude. It's just that Hubbard and associates, like I said earlier, they kind of perfected it because he's using some of the stuff, like I said, that they got out of the MKUltra project. You add all the um, the NLP. Dude, he, the occult, he threw freaking everything into this thing. I, I feel like I rambled off your question, but I, I, I hope that answers a little bit of it. Absolutely. And uh, do tell us, I guess, in a it's sort of a layperson way, because I think if they want the details, people can go to your channel, Days and Confused. Um, but of, of what that is, the mind control, the sort of the basics of mind control in that sense. Do you want it? I have a bunch of different examples that I've used, and I, I think on Sean's show I busted out an example. Do you want me to kind of just give you an example of like an auditing session or a basic drill or something so people yeah. can kind of see how it works? Because it gets complex, my man. This took me years, like I said, of reading books like Steve Hassan about coercive control and mind control. It's really detailed. As you know, you cover you cover ex-cult members too, and I know you know quite about quite a bit about this too. I, I tried to get to get Steve Hassan on, and he did reply to my first email, and then I didn't hear again. And that happens sometimes. What can you do? I was gonna have him on, man. I, I had him confirm, bro. But I'm sorry, I don't. I that book's brilliant, but the ones he's putting out since then, and what he's encouraging people to do uh, since the pandemic hit, I'm not down with that. So I kind of canceled on 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 him. Yeah, like I would say, my opinion is um, definitely his book, um, Combating Cult Mind Control. If anybody was in a cult, if you can get somebody to read it, great book, fantastic book. A lot of that information you took from Robert J. Lifton, who wrote a book called Thought, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, which is basically the, the, you know, the root of like how this stuff works. So um, Steve's later book. So like I said, I'm not I'm not for Trump or Biden. I don't do either side. But he just wrote this book about how Trump's a cult leader, and apparently Biden, you know, who can't even say his own name, is great. I don't do any of that stuff. So as soon as he starts trying to sell books, he's not applying his own information that's in there. Both sides are a destructive cult, dude. It's not just Trump that's the narcissist and fucking everything up. I, I don't like to get into the political shit either, dude. But like I said, when as soon as anybody picks a side, it's like I'm 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 sus on them. Cults on both sides. There really are, dude. I don't know why that's hard to figure out. It's like people want to pick their particular player rather than do what's good for the whole. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you. I think that's a big part of what this podcast is about, sort of showing the the subtle ones and the different kinds of ones. Right. But yeah, take me through some of the, and also for anyone who, who's confused about Steve Hassan, he's just, he, as you say, he's the guy who he's like the guy that everyone talks about about talks about cults and stuff and brainwashing. Them. And and if people, if he's listening and wondering they're a cult, I would highly recommend picking up that book, Combating Cult Mind Control. He did a thorough job of showing. Because what's a cult? Oh, just a wacky belief system. He shows how a destructive cult works, and he uses this thing, by the way, called the BITE model, which stands for Behavior, Information, Thought, and Emotion. And it can allow you to assess whether even a one-on-one -on -one relationship or um, a group dynamic, you can definitely assess using very good uh, information if you're in a cult. So, Andrew, let me give you an example of the very first thing that most Scientologists would do. This is a simple one that people could understand. So they um, will sell you a communication course, usually. Um, I want to, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes on before this, Andrew, about breaking you down, finding your ruin, and then selling you the course. But let me just answer your question and get into what the hell happens. So this communication course, let's say me and you are on this course. You twin up with someone, and then you have a supervisor that doesn't tell you how to do things. They just refer you to the L. Ron Hubbard materials. So you can never speak or interpret the materials. You just do what's said and everybody twins up. So me and you would be sitting a very uncomfortable distance from each other in a chair and we would just stare at each other like this, Andrew. Like and close. we would, you'd have to, 
Yes, like we can actually do it right now. So sure. be completely, this is, I don't recommend this at home, people, but this is how you go into a trance. So if you just sit still, Andrew, no blinking, no thoughts in your head, just be there comfortably. That's the goal of this drill. So me and you would sit here and stare. So I would have just flunked, by the way. And, and let's say I, I move. Let's let's say we're just you're doing a damn good job. It's actually frightening. Can you please come out of that? <laughs> That's really good. God damn it, Andrew. You're putting me back into this into the Scientology Shit. mode. Sorry. I'm not sure we should do this. No, no, that was great, dude. You're, I was just thinking Jesus, we don't quite get it only because and I used to have a thing I can put on the camera and my, my it, it accidentally got smashed when when my girlfriend dropped something on it. But <laughs> sure, sure edit that bit She's out gonna probably. kill you for that dude yeah <laughs> yeah but it was a thing you put on the camera and i would be able to see you through the glass in the camera and then it would be real eye contact but because i'm looking That's a bit terrifying. beneath the camera i'm looking right. at, the, at the screen but still i yeah i was really i can do that but I, I cannot blink and all that stuff but i i do tend to smile or laugh at some point that's what i couldn't stop doing but go on what were you saying yeah yeah okay so i'll just move you through this real quick so let's say we sit here and we just stare at each other. Now this goes on for hours on end and your butt moves. So um, one person is the coach, let's say I'm the coach and you're the student, but we're both doing the same drill. So if you move, I go flunk, Andrew, you twitched, flunk, Andrew, whatever. Um, so this goes on for hours on end, weeks on end. And what happens is what they're looking for is what's called a major stable win. Something has to happen. So when I was a kid and I did this, this is the very first drill I did. Um, I, you know, you go into a trance eventually. Um, I did this with my sister. So my sister, after a few hours of doing this, started to shape shift into all sorts of different creatures. The shadows on the face start to blur and you start to hallucinate a little bit. That's just what happens when you stare at a point anyways. Um, it's a, it's a way of putting yourself into a trance. No big deal. But the thing is, cons that's just one example. And Scientology is constantly keeping you in a hypnotic state. And you're in and around the environment, taking in the L. Ron Hubbard words. So it's all going into your subconscious while you're suggestible. It seems innocent enough, but it's that environment and that trance state that actually implants these ideas without kind of your awareness of just what's happening. So you walk away with these ideas. So after we do the staring one, um, by the way, the first one actually is with your eyes closed and you just have to be there comfortably. The second one is the staring. And then it, this is all the communication chorus. And then the next one is called, um, well, there's a few, I'm just going to cut to the, the main ones. Another one after that is called bull baiting. So now that you can sit there, Andrew, and be there comfortably, not blinking, not being anywhere else in your head, you're just looking at me, I would now push your buttons and I'd say, this is to, this is like a military thing to get you to not react so that you can both take abuse in Scientology and give it while being desensitized. So it, this guy, like I said, I break this down on my channel. It's a whole deep setup, step by step by step, all under the guise of helping you communicate better. So I would say, Andrew, you know, y your eyebrows a little funky. What do you, what do you, what do you got going on there? And I've just got to stare. I've just got. I've just yeah. got to stare. You just have to sit there and stare. I don't want to do this to you because these are not cool. cool. Okay, fine, dude. But <laughs> punish me. If I really, Andrew, I, I was a professional Scientologist, so if I really lay into this, I feel like I could be mean, and I don't want to do that. I, I did this with the old lady once and caused you to just break down. They train you to have no mercy and to really push somebody's buttons. See, it, it feels like, and again, I know this is not the case. You're, you're telling me this woman broke down and stuff like that. It feels like unless you knew me intimately, that there's very little you could say. You couldn't, you know, you don't know uh, the things that would upset. I mean, you're just, you've got a face. And I suppose you could say, oh, your accent's stupid and this or that. But I feel like uh, that's very surface level. But I guess you're, are you telling me that really, it, really, it does go deeper, does it? <laughs> You don't think there's anything that I could say that would, that would, uh, that would without knowing your uh, background, that would you, twitch you? Anything about your looks? Any, now, by, by the way, um, it can get sexual, too. Um, you know, girls would do it with guys. And actually, they would even show their breasts. I mean, they would go to, to high lengths to get somebody to blush, to smile. So let's say a girl was sitting in front of you, Andrew, and she started, you know, doing sexual shit to you and, and kind of getting you to feel... Uh, uh, I, I promise you, dude, if you were at a Scientology place and you signed up for this course, you would definitely uh, have a few reactions. I've never seen anybody um, do. I, I don't want to 
say for sure, but I've never seen anybody go through these courses without reacting what i'd say and i'm sure my girlfriend who edits this podcast it would agree is that i i wouldn't wouldn't react at all it would do it would be like staring at a blank wall <laughs> that's amazing can, can i ask you can i ask you what how how you how you would be able to do that like you, nothing would nothing would be able to get to you Any, anything your girlfriend said to you no well no i'm i'm joking with the the girls what are you a sociopath yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking with the girls stuff uh, the, the girl stuff, of course, because, uh, you know, just because I know she's listening. Andrew, you and your girlfriend would twin up. Let's say you both went down there. So the, the person doing the bull baiting could know all about you. She would absolutely be your partner if you both signed up for that communication course. Yeah, that's a killer. <laughs> but even then, you know they're trying to annoy you. Exactly. You you know it. But and and believe me, I, you know, I felt like like you. I'm, I can take it. But it gets to you after all. Remember, you're doing this for hours on end. And also, I could do that. I could do that. Like anything goes, you know, Hey, Andrew, you just, you know, Louis Thoreau in my Scientology movie does a good version of that. Um, if people want to see that and there's videos, you know, where you can, he, he does the bull baiting in that movie. That's right. Um, and the master in fact, the movie. Y yeah. Yeah. And the, exactly. Um, Joaquin Phoenix is, yeah. you know, was terrible. He would react at everything. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so the, you got the bull baiting. And now yeah. the next one, another one is you break out the book Alice in Wonderland. Now, what the heck does Alice in Wonderland have to do with? Um, this is all part of setting you, age regressing you and setting you into this weird new reality. You also play with clay when you make clay demonstration. These are subtle age regression techniques under the guise of communication. So I would pick out an Alice in Wonderland book. And now I was trying to be an actor uh, Andrew. So these also appeal to artists because we were learning how to communicate with someone. So what, what I do is I take a line from Alice in Wonderland, which are really weird and is getting you to speak gibberish, but getting you to think that that's more and more normal because the more you go up in Scientology, the more you're going to be hit with gibberish. But because you are doing weird things at the beginning, like Alice in Wonderland, you're being set into this new reality slowly. So we would read weird things out of Alice in Wonderland and let's say I was the um, coach, you as a student would have to learn how to acknowledge me, blah, 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 blah. And you would say, I got that. Um, I don't know what some of the lines in Alice in Wonderland are, but uh, whatever, it's all this weird acid trip shit, right? And then you would, you would say, I got that. You have to give a proper acknowledgement to gibberish. So are you getting some idea of just on the communication course, there's already certain tools that seem a little strange but not that strange because you're just communicating but these are mind control techniques that alice in wonderland i have a video on my series it actually comes from the kubark manual which is a cia manual using alice in wonderland which he stole it from in order to mind fuck people again like i said it's really complex just breaking down the, the communication course but there's all these elements of subtle mind control techniques that like you said seem innocent hey I, i'm it would be fun if you and your girlfriend were sitting in front of each other bull baiting it's actually a lot of people would have fun and it's terrifying and then you feel like you're overcoming stuff because i can now stand up to the bully i don't give a crap what anybody says to me but like i said so it seems positive but you got gobbledygook a trans state and you're going to get used to gibberish getting used to giving abuse and also you learn how to control somebody else and be controlled that's another a uh, whole other element. It's really loaded with sophistication um, in terms of what it's actually doing. That's why I tell people, don't go down to a Scientology center. Don't take that personality test, even if you think it's a joke. I've seen people that know it's a joke, that go down there, ha, 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 get locked in that room, have their ruin found, and sign up for a course. Dude, I've seen it many, many times. So I just want to warn people, it's not something to fuck with. You know what I think, you know, you're saying that it could, it's, it's beneficial in some of these uh, practices for like being an actor and stuff like that. I think I would benefit from being the one who says the mean things in the bull baiting because it must be quite liberating to be able to actually say horrible things and not have that guilt. Because I go through life constantly worried I've offended people. And I, I bet a lot of people could relate to that and be like, oh, that'd be, that's a kind of therapy, right? Dude, great point. Andrew, I was just watching, I have this documentary up uh, about the Process Church, and they you the Process Church of the Final Judgment, which is an offshoot of Scientology, and they were talking about just what you said. Um, this is a guy who's been out of the cult for 
God knows how many years. I think it was Timothy Wiley or somebody else. And he was talking about that. And there's some validity in that. They do bull baiting too. They do the training routines that we just talked about in that cult. They stole everything from Scientology. And he said, where else can you actually say these kind of things? Where else can you test if you can take it? Dude, I'm telling you, it's this weird double-edged sword. And I've had so many discussions with ex-Scientologists that will swear that these are beneficial and they're not Maybe they get out of Scientology and they go, okay, the Xenu stuff's crazy and all that, but I'm still going to hang on to these training routines. I know people that are doing these at their house right now, man. And they're, this is why I, I try to break down hypnotism on as, as a main theme, not just some word to throw off and some Spengali, you know, with the, it's not like that. It's more like NLP and it's more like going into a, a light trance state while being totally conscious. You're not falling asleep or anything. You do go into a deep trance state a lot of the times in the Scientology auditing, and I've been knocked out for 30 minutes and then come to. So you can actually completely go to sleep, but these are subtle mind control techniques and hypno techniques of putting you into hypnotism and Scientology. So it does seem beneficial, Andrew, and I'd be lying if I said, I, dude, I got a lot out of Scientology by getting out. Um, I can't say that I don't know. It's it's like I said, it's a double edged sword, but I don't want to push people into, well, I want to get toughened up. Therefore, I'm going to go join a cult. I think you can get those things without that. And um, and you don't need to test your, yourself in a mind control cult environment because there's too many other dangers. And if you just isolate that and you and your girlfriend want to push your buttons or bull bait each other at home, that's probably not harmless. But you still, what's the point? I mean, you're, what, what happens in that, Andrew, is uh, it affects you. Like, I came away feeling bad because I laid into that gal. And she also felt shitty. But then she was on a high a couple hours later because she passed it. And I could say those things to her. It was about her weight. And I could say those things to her. And she had this fake plastic smile on her face because she could finally stand it when I would talk about her weight. That's not healthy, dude. That's what I'm talking about. It seems like it, it's a good thing because it toughens you up. But I'd warn people to look at the subtleties of what's actually happening in these things. It doesn't make you feel good. You've mentioned um, Xenu. And again, I think most people are aware of that. That's like the stuff you find out usually after all the love bombing and all that stuff. And then once you're already sort of in, they tell you about this alien stuff, which, to be honest, is no crazier to me. And people give me shit about this, but, you know, it is. That's fine. Um, than any other religion it's no crazier to me than than like a guy coming to life and walking on water and stuff but it involves aliens so i guess it gets more ridicule than the other ones but what difference to me um did that ever ring true to you um in your 20s when you're most in the cult what was it was that possible to you that xenu was real and all the alien stuff well, like I said, they don't hit you on Xenu until OT3. And by the time you get to that, you've invested. So I, that's a level I got to before I went insane. And, and then a couple years later, uh, that subconsciously, because I had a nervous breakdown outside of their organization, that was the very beginning of me subconsciously doubting. I say subconsciously because I had no idea anything was wrong with Scientology. I thought it was me. Any cult tells you everything's your fault. Oh, it didn't work? Go back and study the materials. You didn't get it. Bro, they don't <clears throat> hit you with Xenu. Very, very few people make it up to that level. 5% of all Scientologists, I would guess, maybe 10%. Um, so by the time I got up to that, you're, and anybody does, you're already 10, 20 years invested of um, nomenclature and space opera, and you've listened to tape lectures that are all about past lives and how L. Ron Hubbard was on the Van Allen belt, and he was like sussing space over here, and he's got the, the track mapped over here in the Palladians, and it's, dude, it's way out there, but you're not hit with that at the beginning. It's the communication course. It's basic tools for life. It's how to fix the family. Then when you get into the auditing, which is where you hold the soup cans, another psychotherapist hypnotizes you and implants false memories into you while you think you're going spiritually free and remembering real past lives. That's when you start to get introduced to the space opera. They throw you onto the tapes, tape lectures. You just drone on and listen to Hubbard just gibberish, you know, uh, in the chorus room for weeks, hours, years on end. So by the time you get up to those confidential levels and bro, they put you through the ringer just to get on there. You're ethics have to be spot on you have to this is where they get the blackmail material on you you have to tell them every 
crime, everything you've ever done, um, and fix everything. So they, dude, they make you want to, um, it feels super special by the time you get up to that level. You've had a million hours of indoctrination in space opera. So by the time you hear the Xenu thing, I completely believed it, dude. And by the way, that created schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder in me, because what you're told on that level is that there's all these, um, every human being is made up of basically um, thetans, what they call them body thetans, and those thetan means soul. So you have all these souls, and there's a whole galactic story about how these souls got onto the bodies of humans. But when we incarnate, according to Scientology, we are all... Um, we have all these thetans and these souls on us. And then when I got onto OT3 and was told this, I felt every night these frickers, these, <laughs> them talking to me. So um, this is, by the way, where the MK Ultra stuff kicks in because they were to disassociate and create multiple personality disorder. That's a technology. And by the time you get up, it's not just stupid Xenu stuff. It's designed to split you um, into different personalities. This is another uh, myth that I just wanted to kind of dispense with because I want to say that this stuff is real dude I was had voices in my head talking to me I went crazy and my dad had to come down and, and I'm, I'm a normal person dude but they made me into this so by the time I worked my ass off spent God knows how much money and dude the choruses and the amount of time you dedicate it's like it's like 12 college choruses so you're the sunk cost, cost fallacy is massive you're totally invested and you totally believe in this you have uh, 50 or 100 p fake past lives you've already believed in implanted into you. So, dude, it, I, it's like it took me so out there. And like I said, voices were screaming in my head every night. I would go to the gym and I would just see. I could almost hear their body things. I could just it. I could almost I, I, I could I would just see everybody around me as filled with these beings and how special I was because I knew this secret about all these other humans I was seeing around me and every religion or whatever Andrew would do the same thing but there is a distinction between a destructive cult and a religion they all may have crazy beliefs but check this out if you remember the Freemason Scientology the OTO what makes those cults cults and different than a religion is the pyramid structure and they dole out information and the idea is to get to the top so the freemasons have you know if they go up to the 33rd degree it goes beyond that actually but they have in other words it's levels and scientology they have all these different levels to get up the bridge so they dole out bits and bits and pieces of information if you're a christian they're going to say we believe in jesus he died for our sins you get the cosmology the creation myth everything up front in these cults, in these secret, in these secret societies, that's why I call that the series "Raised in a Secret Society." To distinguish it between a religion, you don't have to pay a million dollars, sacrifice your family and and your life and your time, and invest in all that to find out their creation myth. You know, it's a million bucks in ten years or whatever to get up to the top, so you can find out um, what it's all about. And by the way, the very top of Scientology. Um, in the 80s before they actually removed uh, the very top of the bridge and changed it because it was so offensive to Christians. So what people were learning, imagine this, Andrew, to get from the very bottom of the bridge all the way up to the top, which is called OT8, which stands for Operating Thetan 8, and a Thetan is a spirit. So Operating as a Spirit Level 8, the highest level you can get into Scientology. He said that he's Lucifer the Lightbringer, He's come to halt the second coming, and he's basically a Satanist, and this is the big secret that he's been holding back from his flock um, this whole time, and congratulations and welcome to the level um, where only a few people got to. Now you know the true story about me, and now you can help me to um, basically do this satanic agenda. That's what people were freaking spending their lives learning when at the very beginning, and most of the way throughout, they thought they were improving their lives and going spiritually free. Now, what if he told you it was a satanic, quote unquote, satanic cult at the beginning? Do you think anybody would join that? So that's the difference between Scientology and, say, Christianity. They don't hornswoggle you and bullshit you and make you pay for levels to find out. They tell you up front what it is. But also, you say talk about the beliefs. Yeah, the beliefs are just as crazy to each their own. But I don't. I, I think all. I think they're all ridiculous. What you're saying about um, the, you know, believing in this stuff led to you actually hearing the voices reminds me of, you know, I've recently taken to drinking non-alcoholic beers and then find myself staggering home, like, on a, oh, my head's actually dizzy 
and I'm, you know, and I've, I've read, you know, the expectation effect. I think by David Robson, a science science writer, and he talks about um, people with Parkinson's who are given placebos, who their brains actually start to produce the chemicals to to calm their their you know the problem, the symptoms. So it's it's incredible the power of the mind. I can see how that might happen. Dude, great point, Andrew, because so much of Scientology is placebo effect and it, it, some of it does quote unquote work. And that's why people, that's why it's so hard to kind of break apart. Okay, what was good? What worked? What didn't? When you add placebo, what I did when I came out of Scientology because I was so out there is I wanted to ground myself in reality. Before I go believing in past lives or any of this stuff again, let me find out what science says. Let me find out what I was kept from because I only learned Scientology my whole life. What does the rest of the world have to say about this phenomena? So then I learned about placebo effect, coercive control, mind control. I told you I learned about the government control project because it goes deep. And I learned about all this stuff that's basically can be shown scientifically. And you're right. Our brains, are, the placebo effect, it's a real thing, dude. So much of Scientology was placebo effect. And that's another thing. Because we believe, because like as an actor, I believed I had a special way to communicate, that communication course that we just talked about, you damn right it gave me the confidence when I went into the audition rooms feeling special. And of course that works. You, if you feel that way, then you perform that way. That's another thing. Like I was listening to, um, to Chris Shelton right before we did this interview, you know, just to see your style or whatever. And he was talking about how belief it doesn't matter what you believe it's the actions but i mean i know people say that this is just my opinion but dude what you believe are your actions so they're not inseparable like your perception of reality will determine everything so even though like we were talking about earlier you might believe in xenu there is a whole cult structure that goes along with that you can't just extract yourself like from the christian church and say hey i don't want to you know um be a part of this anymore and they'll leave you alone it's not like that with scientology so i wanted to get the difference across but nonetheless, the belief will determine, in my opinion, how you will see the world and therefore how you will act. So they're not inseparable. And like you said, the power of belief, placebo effect has proven it. We are, you know, our minds can do incredible things. And we don't need any of these cults or any of these religions, I don't think, to access that. Just my opinion, dude. I don't want to bash people. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you're bashing people. I don't want to bash. I always get sketchy when I talk about people's religions because I have, you know, a lot of my friends are religious and it's a, it's a common thing and they're good people and there's some great ideas in all of these religions too. I think they have basic truths in them. So I don't, I feel a little, I don't like talking too badly about religion, but at the same time, I guess my, I was, mine wasn't a religion. It was a cult. And like I said, I, I'm pretty, there's a difference to those two. But at the same time, I, I don't see too much difference, like you said earlier, with the Xenu and the other creation myths. They all seem ludicrous to me. Yeah. No, that's how I feel as well. And like, you know, we all I, I, I think sometimes atheists can go so far and it's just like we've all got like a friend, a family member, whoever it might be who is religious, and like we don't need we don't need to be offensive to them if they're not causing harm to anyone else. I'm not an atheist either, by the way. I think atheist is another religion. I've never seen people more religious than atheists. So uh, atheist, religious, or whatever, like I said. Some of them. I don't know, bro. I mean, I've had some of them come over to my channel recently and they're worse than just freaking religious people. It's like they're more religious. I don't have a conviction in anything, bro. I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah, but that's YouTube people. Is there a whole subset of atheists, by the way? I'm just learning about this. I imagine there's all types. Well, I, I would say that I, I am an atheist, I would say, but I, I don't think I would go around like... What is that? It just means I don't... I don't believe in a god that means you don't believe in god right well okay i might say the same thing do you believe there's anything outside of the five sense reality or do you is it like does an atheist see it as can i see it taste it such a smell that's it is that what you're talking about is that how tell me how an atheist sees things i think i think it's more like well, well that's this is the thing look it, some of them will think like how you just said you know i mean every atheist is going to have a totally different understanding of the world and different different layers to it so for me it would just be it's not that i don't believe that there could be something out there it's just that i have no reason to believe it until one of my senses perceives it that doesn't mean it's not there but i don't i just don't have a reason but i'm not going to bash people who do believe stuff you know yeah yeah that makes sense i like i said i just i stand somewhere in between um 
I don't know, Andrew, I just don't have a rigid belief on anything. And some of the things that happen in Scientology to me with what we're talking about, the placebo effect and all that, the powers of our mind and stuff, I did have some rather out there experiences. I don't know, I can't prove it. I don't know if the five senses can prove, will ever prove it. But I, but it seems to me like there's probably, in my opinion, a hell of a lot more going on than the senses can perceive. That's just totally an opinion. But for me, that takes me right out of the realm of atheists because I don't I don't think it's just a dead robotic world and I don't I don't think that there's no spiritual aspect to it to me that's a and I know I'm sure atheists hear this a lot but to me that sound and that sounds like a really limited kind of sad way to look at the world I'm sorry <laughs> but you know if that was all that there Are was you baiting me dog it would seem <laughs> Well, I want to, I want to talk. I've never taught, I never actually got to talk to an atheist dude and I didn't know you were one. Yeah. So I, I'm not trying to turn the interview, but frick, I'm, I'm freaking curious how you think. Yeah. You can ask whatever you want. I'm not going to be offended. One of the things my friend coming out of a cult is because I've, I've only been, I only see things one way. I have been a little bit overboard on asking people how they see things so I can get some, so I can broaden my horizons. I wanted to. I've never been, I've never thought as, I don't, I don't know about the God thing or whatever. I don't, I don't kind of do that, but I'm just saying like, um, as an atheist, do you, so, so this is all there is. Does, is it a sad, is it, is it a limited, is it, is it just hard, no scientific way of living a life? How, how do you see things is what I'm, what I'm wondering. I think an atheist wouldn't necessarily say that this is all there is because there's all sorts of, as you're saying, I think there, there could be all sorts of things we don't perceive, just as you say, but have, I think we would all, I don't want to speak for all atheists, I think we would say, but there is a scientific reason behind those things. There is a scientific, uh, you know, there's a reason grounded in science. We can't perceive it because we don't know all the science at the moment. Uh, and then the second part of the answer about, like, is this all there is, I think most atheists believe that like any animal any sort of life or whatever that when we die we die and that's that's really sad man that's real i wish it wasn't the case it to me that seems ridiculous though like i always <laughs> felt like i had a continuity even as a kid that would be i great. always felt a continuity <laughs> i'd love well, that uh, also andrew i i don't claim to know anything like i said dude i don't i don't have my perception set on anything i'm, I'm going to be figuring this out for the rest of my life what i don't want to do is pitch my tent on some religion or some belief system at all so i just trying to learn as much as i can i just had experiences in the cult and the weird way i grew up that i can't prove it but i'm quite certain at least in my vision my reality there's a hell of a lot more um also I don't I don't need to believe that. Like I said, I when I got out of Scientology, I wanted I wanted to learn all the science to explain these things. And once I got to that, there still seemed to be a missing element. So everything like you said that we're talking about, the placebo effect, the coercive persuasion, how people fall for cults, there's a whole science out there that does explain that really well. But there's also some things that I think that it, that it doesn't account for. And that's when you get into personal experience. And then that's when you get into the whole, well, prove it. Show me. Like, show me God. Like, you know, it, I don't think science, the five senses, can do that. So it's it's all, it's like a who knows, right? Yeah. It just seems sad to me, though, Andrew, like thinking that this is all there is. And well, well, hang on. Let me let me respond to that because I don't want you to feel sad about that because, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's also beautiful. I mean, it was Hamlet and Shakespeare. He first says, like, you know, this, the only thing worse than dying is, is going to a heaven that lasts forever, you know, living forever. That's a great point. That's fucking dude. scary. Yeah. So, so how beautiful that we only have this limited time. I do wish it was more like a thousand years a hundred or eighty or something does seem quite short but i do wish we could uh I, you know have a bit more but I, I do think we should let's treasure every moment every second because there's no next bit i absolutely agree with that dude that, that i want to say some. i that's a, some great points that you made and i don't want to sound like i'm drifting back in a new age airy fairyland because that's dangerous to believe in in what you're talking about because then this is what that uh, that Nike shoe cult, uh, Heaven's Gate, you know, where they're going to yes. the next level. Yeah, yeah. This existence doesn't mean anything. That's one of the things that these cults do is what you just 
made a great point about is you don't need to worry about this life. There's many more. And so you skip this one. And by the way, that desensitized the crap out of me to living this life. So I'm not talking about that dangerous new age version of looking at that. I felt, I felt when I came into this world before Scientology and everything, I just felt a continuity just as a kid. Like I didn't feel like I was just nothing. Um, I don't even know how to explain that, but that I only understand that now looking back at my life. But at the same, in that, like I said, Andrew, that's what as ridiculous as Scientology was. The fact that there was more to life than just being an animal or a robot that was already attractive to me, with or without Scientology. So I wouldn't say that that ever left left me. It's just Scientology is is evil in taking that concept and just like you said, this life doesn't mean shit. You can just float off into the ether and we're just trying to get to the next level anyways. That's how, that's very dangerous. I get what you're saying. And look, it, 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 it does feel a bit bleak, this idea that one day you'll just never exist anymore. And we do try to fill that hole. I mean, we seem to be the only animal or you know, the only thing in the world that has any sort of self-consciousness and awareness that we even exist. So to be, it's a curse to be given that awareness that you exist and you will die and you will no longer. I mean, a dog doesn't know or an animal doesn't know. We know we're going to die. That's really, really hard. That's a curse. But I think the best thing that I've got to, and I'm only 33, so I've got way more to learn. You know, in 10 years, I'll think differently. In another 10 years, I might be coming back on here and you're the atheist and I'm the other way. Who knows? But what the best way I've got at the moment. <laughs> I and it, doubt it. I've never, I doubt <laughs> it. We'll see. But uh, I, the best, the best thing I've learned to do and all I can think to do is just don't think about that bad stuff and try and just be as happy as you can every day, live every day, be nice to people and all that stuff. And that's all you can do. I would counter that too with, um, I, you know, since just because of how I grew up, I, I have, um, it's expanded my consciousness and, and trying to actually figure things out even more because dude, I, one of the most mind bending things, cause like, you know, Scientology, as we know, looks retarded from the outside, but how would you know if you're in a cult? You don't, you can't suss it. So when I grew up in something like that and then woke up um, in my early thirties, it made me question everything because to go through most, a good portion of your life, believing one way and then realizing it was all a trap, it was all fake and there was mechanisms that did that on purpose that caused me to see the world in an entirely different way. And if I didn't have that experience, I'm not sure I would have asked very deep questions. And because that wounded me so badly, it took me very, very deeply into myself. And to me, this is where I would agree with Christianity. The kingdom of heaven is within. There's so much that is, is I think that we can access that we just simply um, aren't taught about. I would have loved to learn about the placebo effect, coercive control, cults in high school, narcissists, sociopaths. Why is that information missing? Why were we taught fake history? Why didn't I learn about MK Ultra in school when I, I had to live it and figure it out myself? There's so much missing information that I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't kind of, like I say, get seriously wounded and be forced to look for my own answers. That's why I, I would just I say I'll, I won't become an atheist or a Christian or any of it because I don't know, dude. I don't I don't need a off the peg belief system. I just it, to me it's what it's it's what it's it's life experience and and what you conclude, not like wrapping it up in a box or a belief system. Like I said, Andrew, Scientology did um, a permanent like, mind thing to me. So I know that that might sound a little weird. Or I think I can't help think differently just because it, it did. It, it fucked me the fuck up. You know what I mean? I was going to say, just because, you know, speaking of, of why well, I don't know, you were speaking before actually about it helping with being an actor and stuff like that and sort of gave you the confidence and determination. That sort of leads us on to Tom Cruise, who just has, I just watched him in that film about the planes and stuff, which is not really for me. I didn't enjoy it very much, but the guy looks about 20. He's 60. Um, this guy is almost not of this earth. <laughs> you know, I, I, he looks, I, couldn't, I can't believe what he looks like and how he acts and stuff. Now, uh, the, what's, what, are, what are your thoughts on Tom Cruise? Did you have, ever have any encounters with him? What's, what, yeah, tell me what you think. No, I never encountered any of them. Um, just real briefly at the Celebrity Center where I went, and that's a place in Los Angeles where all the Scientologists that are also actors, producers, etc., go to get brainwashed. That's where they do their courses and stuff. 
And they have certain tiers where you wouldn't necessarily see Tom Cruise or these people around. They take them through the back alley, put them on the fourth floor. They go to their special places. So I never ran into them, but I did hang out with the C-level actors. These were people like, well, um, I don't even know if people would know any of these people, but I went to an acting class, which was called Bobby Lyons. There's two acting classes you would take if you were a Scientologist. The Beverly Hills Playhouse, run by a guy named Milton Casales, which was mostly a full-on Scientology school, and Bobby Lyons. I went to Bobby Lyons, and I met Jason Doring, who was on Veronica Mars. I met um, uh, Laura Perpom was in my class, and uh, a couple of the Masterson, uh, Danny Masterson, uh, step the stepbrother and stepsister there in my class. So I was in, I was surrounded with these people. That 70s show. Yeah. So I hung around the C-level or B-level actors. And Tom Cruise is, an, is a different level. If you listen to Leah Remini talk about her, she, she's freaking funny because she doesn't pull any punches. She basically says he's a, you know, he is a different person, Andrew, even amongst Scientologists. I don't think he looks... I think he looks like he's done something to his face or something, but I understand what you mean about the exuberance and they, this is a, that's a, I think he's, I don't want to diagnose him, dude. You have to do it professionally. So it's just my total guess that he's a psychopath. Um, so with that would come, well, I've learned by interviewing the psychopath on my channel, they're very driven and they're like freaking machines, dude. And they can get so much more done than maybe the average human because they're, narcissism their drive to be the best is driving them to be the best so i think that's one element of the youth the energizer bunny and also the psychopathy he's a dr jekyll and mr hyde so he's a total dickhead dude behind um i'm sorry for cursing by the way if if is that uh, yeah no, it's fine not it's fine. do that brother no honestly i don't want to mess up the okay Fuck i'll it. try not to curse man <laughs> Um, he's not, <laughs> stop that. He's not uh, a good guy, man. I don't know anything about him, but um, I, I know that that's the case just from, from Leah and these other people and my own observations. Um, that, you know, if you listen to it, he got into Scientology because of dyslexia. And if you listen to him talk, I mean, if you really listen, he's not very bright, dude. He's very childlike, which is part of the cult indoctrination. And since he's been so surrounded by David Miscavige in that environment, he's super age regressed. He's super childlike. Plus, he's only been a movie star his whole life. I know just from having a little taste of that, if you're not careful, that can put you into a whole another bubble world. So you add his possible psychopathy, Scientology, and he's a movie star where no one calls him out. That guy is so far removed from anything that we would call the real world. It, I don't even, dude, that guy is different. In a bad way, not in a good way. Tell me about your channel, Days But Not Confused. Do you want to send people over there? No, don't send anybody over there. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, whatever, if people want to. No, I'm just joking. The channel's Days But Not Confused. I talk about Scientology and other expanded subjects, basically um, breaking down the trap and then just uh, doing little video diaries, talking about um, you know what it is. And that's it. Doug, you've been on the edge. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it, Andrew.